Okay. Thank you so much, Avi, for agreeing to give the seminar, and it's all yours. Okay, yeah, thanks, uh, Kate, so much, uh, uh, really, for organizing this and really being a pioneer in our uh, field of, uh, of uh, uh, synthetic cells. I, I'll say that I, uh, for some time, felt a bit of an outsider, but uh, today I feel uh, part of the family. I actually uh, come from uh, an area of uh, drug delivery, so... Uh, bringing medicines to where they're necessary inside the body. And this has coincided uh, over the past uh, several years with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, synthetic cells. And what I'd want to do is maybe combine the two. So give maybe uh, drug delivery 101 and, uh, and uh, highlighting the needs and some of the issues that we're actually missing in, uh, in uh, drug delivery and uh, also showing some work we did with synthetic cells and really keeping it open, uh, the floor open for questions. So what I'd like to touch on a little bit is really our need for personalized medicines, uh, better targeting, uh, drug combinations. These are things that we're seeing in the clinic, but, but not as fast, as not as much as we want, and a slow release, of course, of medicines, medications that can actually affect our bodies. Uh, for longer periods of time uh, and uh, give us a better outcome for the treatment. So if there are questions, I can't see you guys uh, here, but if there are questions, then uh, maybe Kate or just break in and, uh, and say, Avi, listen, some points here aren't, uh, aren't clear. So just feel free to write also in the chat. So I'd like to give a shout out to a, a paper we re recently published. This is a, just a protocol, not a research paper. And uh, some people may find it useful. So we actually, uh, we're getting a lot of questions on how to produce synthetic cells. And uh, we decided within uh, our team, some of the students, the graduate students totally led this uh, to publish this Jove article, which has uh, a film, the uh, protocol of how to produce synthetic cells, including how to produce the lysate uh, for producing proteins. And uh, uh, I think, and I hope people will find it uh, useful. It seems in the meantime, we've been getting more and more questions. And, and I think we all in this community, we feel that uh, some of the fundamentals are still missing out there, more protocols, more uh, approaches so that people can work uh, more easily. And also, I would say another major issue is reducing cost of working with the synthetic cells. So uh, this is just a shout out for, for this Jove uh, article. And uh, when I talk about uh, drug delivery, what comes to mind uh, for me is this paper that was published uh, uh, in uh, 2001 and actually motivated me to enter this field of uh, targeted drug delivery. And what we can see in front of us are three different patients, all have cancer, different types of uh, cancers. Uh, but uh, what's actually common to all of them is that nanotechnology is used for imaging these, uh, uh, their, their tumors. And specifically, 100 nanometer liposomes, lipid-based vesicles, which many of us are aware of, um, were loaded with a contrast agent. The nanoparticles are injected intravenously, so into the vein of the arm. They circulate in the blood and they actually accumulate in the different tumors. So on your top left-hand corner is a patient with a tumor at the base of the tongue. Underneath is a patient with breast cancer. This is the primary tumor. And you can even see uh, metastasis in the local lymph node. And uh, in this case, on the right-hand side is a patient with lung cancer and metastasis in the spine and in the bone marrow of, uh, uh, the, of the hip. And while the tumors are different, uh, the indications and the severity of the disease actually differs, the uh, same uh, principle actually governs the targeting of the nanoparticles or the accumulation of the nanoparticles at these uh, uh, tumor sites after an injection. In fact, what governs it is differences in blood flow and in the blood vessels of the, uh, of the tumors and of healthy tissue. In fact, the tumor due to angiogenesis, the rapid building of new blood vessels inside a tumor to supply the tumor's uh, nutritional needs, uh, new blood vessels are formed and these blood vessels have small perforations. So it's a discontinuous endothelial layer in the blood vessels, which allows nanoparticles, particles of 100 or sometimes even almost 200 nanometers in diameter to exit the circulation and enter the, uh, uh, enter the, the tissue. And this doesn't happen in healthy tissues where we have a very 
closely regulated in a tight uh, system where the endothelial wall is not permissive to nanoparticles to cross into the healthy tissue. So the reason we actually saw the nanoparticles accumulate at the target sites in those three patients is that the blood vessels are perforated, the nanoparticles can exit the circulation and enter the diseased tissue where they're actually pretty much trapped inside the tumor tissue. And if you swap a contrast agent, which we had in the previous uh, image, uh, with a medicine, you, uh, uh, you can imagine that more medicine will accumulate at the disease site, less uh, uh, side effects, so reducing toxicity of the medicines. And that was a, a major advantage that happened in the field of, of uh, drug delivery, especially using uh, liposomes. And this uh, brought to the approval of today of uh, more than 80 nanomedicines. Uh, one of them, the first is uh, 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 to be approved in uh, mid-1990s, so uh, about uh, 25 years ago, uh, called Doxo. This is a liposome, a 100 nanometer liposome, a lipid vesicle with uh, the anti-cancer agent doxorubicin inside of it. Um, these uh, formulations improved over, over the years. Uh, you can put drug combinations today inside these drug delivery systems. And the next generation of medications actually includes already not small molecules, but it actually includes siRNA, so genetic drugs that can turn on and off genes inside the body and actually uh, represent a huge, huge uh, change in the, uh, uh, in the field. And just to to get a feeling of, uh, of, uh, of how impactful uh, some of these medications are. So if we take the last example of Onpatro, which was uh, approved uh, late, uh, uh, about a year ago, and uh, uh, this was for treating a, a condition of the liver where uh, it's called hereditary ATTR, uh, where uh, a specific protein misfolds inside these patients' body in their liver and creates these amyloids, which then go to harm the liver. And of course, this is a, this is a, a horrible disease to have. And when this next generation medication came, so a drug delivery system that delivers an RNA molecule, which shuts down protein synthesis through a small interference RNA or a siRNA, um, the FDA came to approve it and in some of the communications the FDA actually had at the time, they said that for nearly 15 years, they haven't had a clinical trial with such medical significance. Now, the reason is, this, so you can see here actually the, the, uh, uh, the, the trial, usually when we have a, a trial, then the two plots of the treatment and the control are uh, almost tight one to another with uh, several uh, percent difference. And here you can actually see these alligator claws uh, between the uh, between uh, between the two uh, the two treatments, but we're still very very limited with the number of medications we have. In fact, there are only several hundred medicines for treating cancer, and maybe uh, uh, four thousand medicines altogether in the entire uh, pharmacopoeia. Now, if we think of us, we're, uh, uh, we're we cross seven billion people on uh, planet Earth. It makes sense that for different conditions, we may need more medicine. So if we think of personalized medicines, um, we would need more medications than the number of people we actually have. And possibly synthetic cells could be a new platform for producing medicines in a personalized manner inside a patient's own body. So totally less uh, side effects by producing the medicine inside the body itself. And I'd like to give just some examples of what we do with nanotechnology and what we can do with synthetic cells in the field of, of, drug, uh, of drug delivery. But before I go on to that, I think another example of the importance and how medicines actually vary from one uh, uh, condition to another and possibly also from one patient to another is uh, COVID-19, the situation that's surrounding all of us wherever we are on the globe. I'm here in Israel right now and uh, uh, we have people here on this call really from all around the world and we're all affected by this virus. But in fact, this virus differs slightly from country to country, or at least from continent to continent. And more than that, different patients actually that have COVID-19 may need a slightly different treatment for treating them 
because their immune system actually will respond to different aspects of the virus. Uh, and we can see here in front of us, the, uh, on the left-hand side, is the, uh, is, is the first vaccine that was produced by Moderna, a US-based company, a Boston-based company, where they uh, are loading messenger RNA into their nanoparticles for, a, uh, 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 for inducing the formation of proteins inside the patient's body, which will, uh, 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 which will then be recognized by the immune system. And these proteins actually have similarity to the protein that are expressed on the COVID-19. Now, as the virus mutates, as COVID-19 mutates, of course, in many cases, you need to also change the sequence of RNA you have inside, the, inside your drug delivery system. Now, this can change pretty rapidly. If we think of the flu shot of last year, usually is not good enough for the flu shot of this year. And the same may be also true also for COVID-19. And uh, what better than a synthetic cell to actually have a platform that can produce a medicine and then can be used uh, for changing needs inside, uh, inside, uh, inside the body. So uh, the drug delivery systems I'll uh, be talking about in uh, uh, both in synthetic cells, but less for RNA, uh, are lipid-based drug delivery systems, but uh, specifically liposomes. And we know that there's a lot of engineering that goes into the uh, uh, synthesis of a, of a liposome uh, into its lipid bilayer, its size, maintaining its stability. And when we talk about drug delivery, another thing we have to have is the ability of a medicine that will be loaded into the inner aqueous solution or into the lipid bilayer. Uh, we want to make sure that it's also excreted or uh, released from the drug delivery system as we reach the target site. But more than that, these systems, when they're uh, introduced into the body, they also have to be uh, uh, engineered in a way that will avoid the immune system. Specifically, when we talk about drug delivery systems, we'll coat them on their outer surface, in many cases, with polyethylene glycol, PEG. This uh, polymer actually, uh, 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 through hydrogen bonds, binds to water molecules, and this greatly increases the circulation time or the residence time of these particles inside the blood. Specifically, a particle 100 or 200 nanometers in diameter without polyethylene glycol on its surface will remain in circulation for less than 30 minutes before it will be removed through the immune system. But uh, particles that have polyethylene glycol on their surface can stay inside the body for sometimes 48 and 72 hours before being detected. And the reason is, or the way we, we, uh, uh, we think of it is that when there's polyethylene glycol on the surface of these particles, they, the polyethylene glycol binds the water molecules and the body actually sees a bunch of water molecules circulating in the blood rather than uh, the particle itself. And of course, uh, when you have water circulating, that's not a, big, uh, not a big issue. Over time, the peg sheds from the particles and then the particle is detected, marked with proteins, and then of course, uh, removed from the body. And that's why it's important that the particle really reach its target site before, uh, uh, before it's detected. I just wanna give an example we, uh, uh, we were involved in, uh, and this regards to the importance of the lipid bilayer. And this is a technology we developed several years ago for treating a condition called osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is degradation of the joints and the cartilage uh, in this uh, patient you can actually see is, uh, is degraded. This is due to different conditions such as excess sport or uh, uh, weight or uh, some genetic uh, factors. And what we did is we injected liposomes directly into the joint and used them as a, as a lubricant, a system for reducing friction and wear inside, uh, inside the joint. And uh, these particles were engineered of two, uh, of two phospholipids, DMPC and DPPC, a 14-0 carbon and a 16-0 carbon. And together, they, these actually formed the lipid bilayer that was soft enough to uh, be able to carry the body's weight and actually act as a spring, but also rigid enough not to totally fall apart under the huge uh, uh, a strain or stress we have inside, uh, inside the, the joints, specifically the knees. So this uh, technology was uh, pretty successful. 
we uh, uh, no medicine at all. The, the lipid bilayer itself is the medicine. And we tested it clinically and we, we showed that patients that had these particles injected intraarticularly directly into their knees uh, had uh, improved mobility, were able, to, uh, were able to regain their daily function, to walk, to climb uh, up and down stairs, and uh, uh, to do uh, uh, what they like to do without joint pain. And one of the nice things, actually, the outcomes of this uh, trial was when we actually looked at the uh, 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 results of the side effects that patients had, patients actually had a good side effect. They were consuming less pain medication. This is a small graph on the left-hand corner. We actually quantified the amount of pain medicine these patients were taking using our system and the existing drug on the market. And we saw that they were consuming about one quarter to one third of the amount of pain medicine. And of course, that's very significant when a patient has a chronic illness, which needs to also deal with other uh, issues in their lives. And of course, reducing pain medicine is, is extremely important. Now, we could imagine such a, a particle in this case that's injected intraarticularly that could also possibly produce different medicines that would, uh, that would address specific needs of the joint and possibly also improve joint uh, function as they, uh, uh, as they work. But I'd like to, to show or highlight two examples of how we use nanotechnology to uh, uh, improve cancer treatment in one case uh, and in the other to uh, shut down uh, genes in cancer and then highlight them also in the field of, uh, of uh, synthetic cells. And specifically, the first uh, aspect uh, I'd like to, to discuss uh, regards to personalized medicine or how we actually determine which medicine is best for each patient. And this is actually a huge, uh, a huge challenge when we come to uh, treat uh, cancer. And uh, this is an example from a conference I attended several months ago. Uh, here, this was a medical conference, uh, uh, physicians and, uh, uh, and uh, specifically physicians in the field of uh, uh, breast cancer. And they were asked how to treat this, uh, this patient. And uh, so uh, it's, it's a female, her age is under the age of 50. She has no negative breast cancer. Uh, it's ER positive, HER2 negative, so it's rather defined, well-defined type of tumor uh, with a recurrence score of 21 to 25. And they asked the physicians what medicine uh, they, should, they would uh, give or what treatment would they give this specific patient. And they give four options, chemotherapy and Erbitox, uh, 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 surgery and Erbitox, uh, and uh, so four different, uh, four different options. And uh, I'm a PhD and sitting in the audience, I was sure that uh, at least, uh, you know, there'd be one right answer that most uh, physicians would choose. And uh, the, the physicians actually, uh, the physicians uh, uh, went in and uh, uh, the physicians went in and, uh, and, and typed in their, their answers. And uh, uh, this is what, uh, what came out. Now, I personally, uh, I, I personally think that if our lives wouldn't depend on this, this, this could, almost be, uh, could almost be funny because uh, it almost broke up evenly between the physicians which treatment they would give. So it's really not only patient uh, dependent, but also physician dependent, which treatment a person would get. Now to make the physicians uh, in this conference uh, not feel awkward about it, they showed actually the results from another, uh, another uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, meeting where 5,000 physicians were asked the same question. And you can see also there uh, the, the, uh, the results broke up between the different physicians. So it's really hard to decide which medicine to give a, a patient. In fact, uh, uh, when we look also at, uh, uh, at genetics, genetics also can point to different types of medicines that each patient will have. Just in the interest of time, I won't, uh, I won't, go, uh, I won't go into uh, to that. So I saw some questions came up about the cartilage. I'll answer those in just a minute, but I'll just uh, finish this, uh, this uh, story right here. What we did is we took uh, liposomes, and this case are 100 nanometer liposomes, and we loaded them with a minuscule dose of medicine. In fact, each liposome was loaded with a different medication, uh, which was enough to kill only a specific or a single cell. 
And because the dose of the medicine is so low per liposome, we added also a DNA barcode into each one of our, uh, into each one of our nanoparticles so that uh, we would know which medicine we have in, inside each one of these liposomes. Now, so we have a cocktail of the liposomes. Each one is barcoded with a DNA barcode, and each one of the liposomes actually contains a different medication inside of it. We can go on and inject these liposomes intravenously. They circulate in the blood, and then utilizing the leaky blood vessels of the tumor, they accumulate inside the tumor and then distribute between the tumor cells. So we have now nanoparticles, each one with a different medication and a DNA barcode inside of it that are distributed between the different cells inside the tumor. At this point, we wait for 48 hours. In fact, it takes 24 hours for the particles to accumulate in the tumor and the tumor cells. And then it takes another about 24 hours for the medicines to act inside the cells. And at that point, we take a small biopsy out of the tumor or the metastasis. And this, this biopsy actually contains live and dead cells. The live cells contain barcodes of ineffective medications and the dead cells contained barcodes of effective medications inside of them. So here, within a very short assay, we were actually able to screen medicines inside the patient's own tumor. So we used nanotechnology to screen the medicines inside the patient's uh, uh, own, uh, own tumor. And we went on to check this, uh, this approach. So just to show what it looks like, this is a tumor cut, uh, a fluorescent cut of a tumor. Uh, the blue are the uh, nuclei of the cell and the red are the nanoparticles distributed inside the tumor. Or more closely here, you can actually see green barcodes inside a triple negative breast cancer cell inside a, 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 after reaching the, the tumor site. And the readout we get is a, a single cell readout. These are the cancer cells the way they responded to the different medications. And on the upper panel is actually a panel of the dead cells. And on the lower panel is a panel of the live cells. And this is just representative. It's just to show that we have more blue barcodes, which denote for uh, the anti-cancer medicine, gemcitabine and the dead cells compared to the live cells. So we actually saw major differences in the uh, type of medicine and the barcode, of course, the corresponding barcode in the live and dead cells, meaning that for certain medicines were more effective while other medicines were less effective. Or just to make this point a bit clearer, for each five dead cells we found with uh, a cisplatin barcode inside of it. Cisplatin is, is a, uh, an anti-cancer medicine based on platinum. And uh, so for each five dead cells, we had one live cell, so this is pretty good. But then when we went on to check another medicine or the barcode of another medicine, we actually show, found that for this medicine called gemcitabine, we had for each 6,500 dead cells, we had only one live cell. So, uh, of course, we'd rank gemcitabine before cisplatin, and these both would be better than doxorubicin or caffeine. So we went on and we ranked the different medicines in order to help the physicians actually come to their decision. Uh, so trying to boil down the information and create a... Uh, uh, a ranking system where you rank the efficacy of the medicine uh, per, a, a, a per tumor. And uh, uh, we went on and we tested this prediction and we saw that the prediction actually proved itself. So when you treat according to the prediction, which we saw based on the barcodes, you got smaller tumors. In this case, the mice lived longer. And more than that, when we, do the, when we dived into the tumor itself and checked the histology, we also saw that not only are the tumors smaller, they were actually really regressing and the tumor cells were dying away. And what I want to point out in this, uh, in this uh, uh, slide is that uh, different tumors, and also we know in the clinic, different patients respond to different medications. So from one side, we need more tools for actually creating personalized medicines. And what's better than a synthetic cell than that? And more than that, even for different patients that respond to different medicines, we, within the existing medications, then also there choosing the right medicine is actually a, a, a decision that needs to be made based on the activity inside. Due to the interest of time, I won't go into the data on, uh, on, on uh, different cell types inside the tumor and also to the metastasis, but I'll just say that 
Also, different metastasis responded to different uh, types of medication, and also different cell types inside the tumor responded to different types of, of medicine. So, um, I'll just wrap this, uh, this concept up with, uh, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, animation, which uh, uh, these are the barcoded nanoparticles. They are ejected the blood and then they enter the, the tumor tissue through the leaky blood vessels. At that point, the nanoparticles actually distribute, uh, the, the barcoded nanoparticles distribute to different tumor cells. And then based on the type of medicine that's inside the nanoparticle, you get either uh, cells that responded or didn't respond. So just to touch on these uh, uh, two items, this item spoke about, uh, about personalized medicine and that different patients actually respond to different medications. And it's, uh, uh, a, it, it's, it's a great need of the, uh, the field of the community of, uh, of medication or medicine to go and, uh, and develop medicines that would be personalized. Uh, so I was asked about the previous, uh, uh, by, on the previous part about the uh, uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, people asked how long, how long uh, do the lipids actually remain inside the joint? And that's a great question. So this uh, regards to treating osteoarthritis and intraarticular injection of liposomes. So the answer is that in, in, uh, in patients, uh, sorry, in, in rabbits, we saw that the particles stay for seven, we, seven days, sorry, is the half-life of the particles in the joint. And uh, you have 1% of the particles after 30 days inside the joint. Having this said, in patients, in human patients, we actually sh we saw that for 90 days, the patients actually responded very well to the medication. Now, we had, this was a single medicine, medication, one single injection. And uh, even though I showed for 30 days and I see in the chat, people ask 30 days, uh, we actually followed the patients for 90 days. And over those 90 days, the patients responded really well to uh, medicine, slight decrease uh, at, at the 90 point. But uh, so it was a single injection. And what it m must mean is that uh, the, the, this injection probably supports also some other activities inside the cartilage that uh, uh, support better activity. So uh, uh, the next question that I, I got here, nanoparticles injected intravenously usually get trapped in the liver. How do you design liposomes to actively target specific tissues? So that's a great question, Aston. And uh, so part of the particles are uh, trapped by the liver, but this is mainly, it's also a size and also a surface property. And uh, so part of the particles are trapped by the liver, but usually if the particles are uh, between 100 and 200 nanometers in diameter, usually they can evade uh, the, the, the liver and uh, reach other tissues. Still, some of them will be trapped in the liver. It can reach even 60 and 70 percent, but uh, uh, that still the, you get, let's say, 10 percent of your injected dose in the tumor itself. Now, size is one way of targeting tumors. And uh, for example, Doxil and other types of anti-cancer medications are around 100 nanometers in diameter. But another way to target tumors, which is becoming more and more uh, uh, useful, is actually coating the particle on its outer surface with specific ligands, such as proteins or other molecules that will act, target a specific tissue type inside the body. And uh, so uh, Shivani is asking, uh, uh, so the barcoded nanoparticles are used as, uh, to assay which drug is most effective against tumor cells. Can this technique be assayed to see which drug yields the least systemic uh, toxicity? That's a great uh, question. So we're actually looking at that now. Can you actually also look at toxicity inside the patient based on, uh, uh, based on, based on this assay? Because uh, drug efficacy is not only about the uh, uh, which medicine to give, it's also which right medicine to give based on side effects. So sometimes you'll choose the second drug in the, uh, in the line just, not to, just to avoid, in order to avoid toxicity to the patient. Uh, and at that point, you probably look maybe at other tissues and how these barcoded nanoparticles would affect also other tissues inside the body to try and reduce toxicity. So thank you for that uh, uh, question. So um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna move on to uh, just a uh, 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 so here I, I showed uh, delivering uh, uh, small molecules 
But in many cases, you want to also deliver a protein. And, and our synthetic cells are really great at producing uh, proteins. For example, protein, the protein that can be delivered is collagenase. And uh, uh, we use the not synthetic cells. We use drug delivery systems in order to deliver collagenase to tumors that have a high expression of collagen. So these tumors are, have very low penetration of drug. And you actually need to drill into the tumor in order to, uh, uh, to reach it. Specifically, what we had in mind is, is a drug delivery system that will dig into the tumor and allow other medicines to, to follow. And the, the, t the tumor we were looking at is pancreatic cancer. We know pancreatic cancer is a very hard cancer to treat, and it actually has a huge excess of collagen that's produced inside, uh, inside these pancreatic tumors. And what we did is we uh, first looked at pancreatic tumors. So on the right-hand side, you can see a cut from a, 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 a diseased pancreas. This is a pancreas that has, uh, 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 that has pancreatic cancer. And all the blue you can see here is all collagen fibers. And these collagen fibers uh, create a very dense barrier that medicines cannot penetrate. And they actually protect this barrier, this collagen barrier is protecting the cancer cells from being uh, killed by the, uh, uh, by the medication. Look at the left-hand side of the, of the tumor, I'm sorry, of the, of the pancreas. This is a healthy pancreas, and you can see hardly any blue color in, uh, in the healthy pancreas. So uh, what we thought is to deliver collag collagenase, which is an enzyme that degrades collagen and specific to collagen, and uh, to see if we could actually change the penetration into the, uh, into the tumor. And what we saw is that uh, uh, a, quick, uh, 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 a quick injection of collagenase into tumors actually degraded the collagen barrier and allowed medicines to penetrate in a better manner and reduced, when you followed with another medicine, uh, you actually improved, uh, improved treatment. So I don't want to uh, expand on this, but just to say that, uh, uh, that uh, in some cases we deliver different types of medications, such as protein drugs, not only that will uh, bind to a cancer cell, but certain uh, protein drugs that will also bind to the extracellular matrix of a tumor. And the extracellular, extracellular matrix of a tumor is very important when you want to come and treat for diseases such as pancreatic uh, cancer. So here we used an enzyme that degraded the collagen in order to improve the following treatment. I'd like to uh, uh, end this part of the therapeutics with a, a, an example of using a RNA interference. So this is a delivering of RNA molecules, slightly different than the COVID-19 treatment, which is about delivering messenger RNA. This is about delivering short or short interference RNA. So small uh, molecules of RNA, and this was a, a phenomena discovered in early 1990s on petunia flowers. Uh, the image you have here is from the original paper by Napoli and uh, co-workers. And they had a petunia flower, which they wanted to encode for uh, 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 better, more beautiful colors inside. They added the gene, and instead of having uh, more color or stronger color, actually all the color depleted in their, uh, target, uh, uh, in their target flower. And, but unfortunately, they couldn't explain the phenomena, which was explained by Fire and Mello in uh, 1998, granting them the Nobel Prize in 2006, uh, and explaining that short uh, molecules of double-stranded RNA can actually shut down the production of proteins inside of cells. So this, uh, this is a field that's called RNA interference. So it's using RNA not to encode for the production of a protein, but to stop the production of a protein. And uh, when, when you look at it for medicine, uh, 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 as an engineer or looking at the process, so we know that DNA encodes RNA encodes the protein and what uh, short interference RNA means that small molecules of RNA will stop the production of protein uh, uh, through the degradation uh, of the messenger RNA. And uh, from a drug delivery perspective, actually this is pretty complicated because uh, if you want to use this now to shut down a protein that's associated with the disease, you'd have to add an exogenous RNA molecule into the body, and for that you need a carrier because RNA will not survive long enough in the circulation to reach a cell, to penetrate a cell, and then to uh, uh, act uh, and uh, reduce uh, protein production. So you need a carrier that will, that will 
that will bring it into the cell. And I always think of it as a, a, a taxi or an Uber, which drives it into the cell, opens the door and allows the RNA, which is the passenger, to enter into the, uh, into the cell. And, and I think this is best highlighted how important this is. So this is a, a Nobel laureate, uh, Professor Phil Sharp from, from MIT, uh, uh, said at the time, three biggest problems with RNAi therapeutics remain delivery, delivery, and delivery. So how do we actually deliver with that? And our approach at the time was to use a molecule called polyethylene imine, uh, and uh, uh, we modified the, uh, the particle slightly. It has a positive charge, so it binds RNA pretty effectively. And after screening many different types of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, polyethylene imine uh, molecules, uh, we found one that, that was extremely effective in carrying the RNA into cells and later on also into, uh, uh, into a, uh, in the body in mice. At very low doses, the RNA interference was able to knock down a gene that's associated with metastasis. The gene is called TI2. And uh, we were able to get to reach about 80% uh, uh, knockdown. These particles are slightly different than our synthetic cells. They look more like an onion rather than, uh, than a vesicle. And the reason is that each layer of the RNA, which is negatively charged, was coated by a layer of the positively charged polyethylene amine. And uh, they're on from layer by layer until you have this onion-like particle which uh, delivers the RNA. And uh, in different types of tumors, we were able to, uh, uh, to, knock down, uh, to knock down genes. So for example, here on the top, you can see the beginning of a, of a, of a, of a, of a treatment cycle. This is hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, a cancer type of tumor that's very uh, prevalent in, uh, in developing countries. And on the right-hand side, on the bottom, you can actually see the knockdown of the, uh, of the tumor inside, a, a, in, uh, of a gene inside the tumor. So how is all this uh, related to, uh, to, uh, to synthetic cells? Well, the RNA sequence can actually be produced inside, uh, inside a synthetic cell. And I'll show you that in just one moment. And uh, um, I think when we all think of synthetic cells, we look at different mechanisms that we can actually load into them and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and carry out. And we were looking in the interest of drug delivery, how could we take the amazing tools that people are producing here and integrate them into medical systems so that we could actually utilize uh, uh, a synthetic cell for therapeutic applications. And what we had in mind is uh, one of these uh, uh, synthetic cells or maybe billions of them circulating in the body and actually uh, with a capacity to, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, with a capacity to produce a medicine that would be specific to the patient and then uh, uh, and it would also be produced where it's actually most necessary inside, uh, the, patient's, uh, inside the patient's body. And the system we used is a, a system that many of us here on this call use. It's a, a liposome-based system, which has inside of it all the molecular machines that are necessary for decoding DNA uh, and producing RNA and then protein inside, a, inside, a, uh, inside the synthetic cell. And also uh, uh, these synthetic cells are, are engineered in a way where we hope to have them actually uh, implanted inside, uh, inside the body replacing natural malfunctioning cells. So the first uh, synthetic cell we were able to, to produce uh, here was a GFP producing a synthetic cell. It's rather large. And uh, uh, Nitsan Krinsky, a PhD student in my group, was able to actually uh, image the production of green fluorescent protein over time inside a synthetic cell. So this is uh, uh, capturing the, the synthesis of superfolder GFP so it folds uh, within a, a very short period of time, and actually the fluorescence of this uh, of this system as uh, uh, as she runs uh, the experiment. So this is a, a movie of about uh, 45 minutes of the production of a, of a fluorescent protein. And for those that may be using regular fluore GFP, not superfolder, of course the the folding takes longer than for the superfolder, so you may see it after several hours or even maybe only the next morning after, uh, after producing the uh, synthetic cells. So what does an, uh, uh, an array of uh, synthetic cells that we have uh, look like? Uh, they, they have different sizes. Most of them are in the micron scale. And uh, 
uh, and not all of them are active, but many of them uh, uh, many of them are capable of actually producing a protein. We find that about 50% of them are active and capable of producing a protein. And as you go smaller in size, usually you lose some of the activity because not all the components uh, actually uh, enter the, uh, the synthetic cell during the production uh, process. Uh, we found that we can go down to about 170 nanometers in diameter and still be active. And uh, uh, the reason we weren't able to go smaller than that is uh, that we weren't that effective in actually loading the DNA into a small, extremely small synthetic cells. The ribosomes we actually found uh, in, uh, in uh, very small synthetic cells, but the DNA plasmid, which uh, we don't use any histones to, uh, uh, to try and condense, uh, were hard to load into smaller particles. And the reason we wanted to go small is so we could actually uh, 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 utilize this for, uh, for specific aspects of drug, uh, drug delivery. And we showed that we can produce different types of proteins that are uh, used in, uh, in medicine for imaging or for treatment. Uh, specifically, one of the proteins we produced together with uh, uh, Professor Itai Ben-Har from the Tel Aviv University is uh, Pseudomonas exotoxin A, an extremely uh, toxic protein where uh, uh, one uh, copy of the protein is enough to kill uh, uh, a cancer cell. And you can see here a co-culture of the synthetic cells together with triple negative breast cancer cells. And actually the, uh, uh, the toxicity of these, uh, of these uh, Pseudomonas exotoxin uh, synthetic cells to the, uh, to the cancer cells that they're uh, uh, staying with. But um, uh, one of the things we wanted to have to have so the synthetic cells will actually be active inside the body is a switch. So we could turn on the synthetic cells and, uh, and be able to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, activate them only when it's, uh, when it's uh, uh, most necessary. And we added a light switch to the synthetic cell so uh, uh, DNA they, or a molecule, a cage molecule that sits on the DNA and is released through uh, light irradiation in order to free the DNA and then produce protein. So our system, I'll say, isn't perfect. You can notice uh, there is some leakage also of uh, protein production in the cells, uh, synthetic cells that aren't exposed to light, but uh, uh, still several orders of magnitude more protein produced when we expose the, these synthetic cells to, to light. And this was true also inside the body. Uh, implanting these synthetic cells inside the body, irradiating them with light, released the cage and actually allowed for the production of, in this case, of luciferase inside, a, a, inside the cell. So um, we went on and we tested the ability to produce proteins inside of tumors. Specifically, what we had in mind are a, are a, a, are a, a therapeutic proteins, uh, but we started first with luciferase in order to see how long the system would actually last and, and could we regenerate it over time. And you can see here synthetic cells that are injected directly into the mammary fat pad of a breast cancer tumor. And uh, uh, the, the amount of uh, luciferase de declines over time, but then we can regenerate it by injecting uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, rejuvenating the particle after a, a, after a, a 50 minutes in order to continue protein production inside, a, inside the body. And when we looked at the cut of the protein in order to see if we got a therapeutic activity inside, a, inside the tumor a, a tissue, we saw that we, uh, uh, using a cast phase three uh, marker, we saw that around the area that the synthetic cells were injected, we saw cell death and, uh, and, uh, and activity. So um, just to, to answer some of the questions of, uh, that, that are coming up. So what is the lifetime of synthetic cell? That's a great question. Uh, so we saw that when you inject them, I assume this means inside the body. And, and I think the lifetime of a synthetic cell we were able to, uh, uh, to record uh, was about 48 to 72 hours until we uh, didn't see any remnants. Uh, I'll say we, we never followed for longer periods of time. Uh, but I would assume that, uh, that uh, sometime later, depending on also what tissue you inject the synthetic cell into, the synthetic cell would be degraded. And uh, it seems that a uh, superfolder GFP expressed in the synthetic cells gets less fluorescent in the middle after a while. 
so they tend to distribute close to the membrane. So I'm not sure about that. Uh, there is some uh, bleaching of the system uh, as, we, uh, as we irradiate it with the with, so it fluoresces. Um, so there is some bleaching uh, uh, that, that you have inside. But uh, I do think that the uh, uh, ribosomes, uh, and people I think have looked at it, uh, tend to, in some cases, to be closer to the circumference of the synthetic cell and uh, uh, produce the protein uh, in, that, uh, in that location. So that is uh, possible, but, but in this case, uh, for the superfolder, it may also be light-based uh, issues. So what aspects of drug delivery make it essential to have the liposomes as small as 170 nanometers? Diana asks, and uh, uh, so that's a, a great uh, question too. And uh, uh, keeping uh, particles in the nanoscale many times allows them to uh, exit uh, the circulation and enter tumors or enter inflamed tissues. Uh, and when particles become larger, you usually have to inject them locally uh, because in the blood they'll be cleared in a faster manner or they'll be, uh, um, uh, or they'll be, uh, uh, or they'll be, uh, uh, or that they'll be uh, cleared in the liver. Uh, Jefferson asked, uh, did you use light activated DNA templates to control uh, exotoxin uh, uh, A expression? So the answer is no. We, uh, we uh, uh, initially for the luciferase, we used a light activated system but we didn't do that for the uh, exotoxin uh, system uh, yet. Uh, uh, and did you see off-target uh, cell death where low amounts of the toxin were produced in the absence of light? So yeah, so uh, we, we did control in the paper, you can see uh, uh, the control groups, but uh, uh, we, uh, we didn't use light to activate it there. We uh, uh, used the, the body temperature to activate the production of, uh, of the synthetic cells. Is there a strong immune response against the synthetic cell? So uh, uh, McDermott asked that, and, and I think that's a, a super important question. Uh, and thank you for sharing that with us. So one of the challenges, and I want to touch on it at the end, but, but thank you for bringing up now, uh, we're pretty close to the end, uh, is that uh, one of the major challenges we have today is how can we reduce toxicity of synthetic cells, specifically, the lysates many of us use are uh, uh, bacterial lysates, which of course induce uh, some uh, uh, immune response. Uh, possibly using the pure system will reduce some of these immune responses. And another uh, approach that we were uh, uh, looking at but uh, haven't explored deeply is maybe using plant-based extracts rather than uh, bacterial extracts in order to, uh, uh, in order to produce uh, uh, in order to reduce side effects. And if I already mentioned plant-based versus bacterial extracts, another issue with a bacterial extract or another limitation of bacterial extracts is that uh, post-translational modifications of these systems are uh, extremely limited. And now uh, many medicines, uh, especially protein medicines, require post-translational modifications in them so uh, uh, such a, a bacterial uh, lysate may not be suitable for some of the medications, including insulin, which in uh, many forms actually needs to have a post-translational modification uh, uh, in order to do that. Uh, another immune type of immune response we have with some of the synthetic cells is different uh, differences in pH that we'll have in the lysate and in the, in the, in the tissue culture, for example which can affect the activity of the, of the cells, the living cells or the natural cells. Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, when you wanna inject the system into the body, you have to reduce uh, toxicities, reduce side effects, and also think about the uh, osmotic pressures, pHs that you have inside the body and you have in the synthetic cell. Having all this said though, I think it's extremely important to remember that for synthetic cells to enter the body is very early times. The way I imagine it a little bit is that all of us uh, are at the eve of a synthetic cell world uh, are pretty much at like the first years of, a, of, a, uh, 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 of the field of stem cells, uh, when things were just being discovered and invented. And more than that, there was discovery here where it's totally invention uh, that we're all participating in. So uh, I think uh, uh, for all of us, to even to make small leaps in this uh, area, uh, will be extremely significant. And again, the tools that all of us are combining, I think can be used 
uh, for for better treatment of uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, patients. So I'll just end with uh, this uh, uh, this slide. This uh, just uh, exemplifies that you can do not only proteins, you can also do RNA. And uh, here we used, uh, because we produce a single strand of RNA uh, in uh, the synthetic cell or RNA of uh, messenger RNA, and we wanted it to fold on itself because uh, a small short interference RNA is, uh, is better when it's double stranded. So we used, uh, we used a system that will bind on itself and actually create a, a, create a, a hairpin. And uh, uh, we tested the, these synthetic cells, their ability to knock down genes, gene expression inside of, uh, uh, inside of natural cells, inside of cancer cells. And we actually show, saw that we could uh, uh, produce RNA that uh, folded and then uh, uh, knocked down a gene inside, uh, inside of cells. So I would say that the synthetic cells, when we look at therapeutic avenues, can be used not only at the protein uh, level for producing a, uh, uh, for producing a medicine, but also for producing um, RNA for knocking down genes inside the body. So uh, I'll end here first by thanking uh, Kate and everyone really for, uh, uh, for participating and asking amazing questions. And just to wrap up, uh, I showed a little bit about uh, injecting liposomes into joints for treating osteoarthritis, uh, using a nanotechnology of barcoded liposomes for uh, for uh, determining which medication is best for each patient, a personalized medicine platform. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, when we look at uh, synthetic cells uh, to, uh, uh, as platforms for producing proteins inside the body, uh, extreme uh, importance. I didn't get to talk about the last point, which uh, regards to, uh, to drug delivery and gender the, or, or sex differences between us. Not only are we different uh, many times in the, the type of medicine that we need to, uh, to deliver, but we also find that uh, males and females regarding the type of medicine uh, that they're uh, receiving, that should also be accounted for. And that possibly synthetic cells could also help us with, uh, uh, with uh, solving some of the issues around that. So looking at drug delivery and synthetic cells, I think synthetic cells hold huge promise uh, for uh, changing the field of medicine and possibly allowing uh, for small factories that would be patient specific to produce a patient specific medication inside our body based on our own genetics, on our own uh, uh, needs and improving our therapeutic profile and reducing our side effects. So thank you so, so much uh, for, uh, uh, for this uh, talk this evening and, and really for being uh, with me here today. And I'll, I'll be glad to take any more questions if they come. Thank you so much, Abby. That was fantastic. Um, there is another question for you in chat. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the compliment. Have you looked at uh, how uh, and where synthetic cells are broken down and release their cargo? So what we uh, uh, did in order to uh, release the cargo from the synthetic cells, we, we approached it two ways. So one, we tried to use a very soft lipid so uh, uh, DMPC, which in the body temperature is below, uh, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's TM, it's, it's above its phase transition temperature. We reduce also the amount of cholesterol inside these uh, synthetic cells, so the membrane is more permeable. And we also, at the protein side, we uh, specifically for the pseudomonas exotoxin, uh, we used, uh, we used a, a, a peptide at its end, which helped it actually cross membranes and be released. So I think those three components, uh, having a soft lipid bilayer, less uh, cholesterol, and also adding a, a, a slight uh, more hydrophobic domain at the uh, uh, distal end of the, of the protein, uh, all help it uh, penetrate uh, the, the synthetic cell. Still not perfect. I mean, uh, uh, we're early on in evolution. I would say we're still uh, before uh, reaching uh, 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 different types of transporters that uh, allow us in. Uh, we're, uh, I know we're competing with the natural cells today that are extremely sophisticated, but I've been around for so long. So our synthetic cells still don't have those, uh, uh, those transporters uh, that, and I know that people here uh, in around the world are really working hard to, to introduce those. Thank you so much. Um, you answered most of the questions in chat already. Oh, new one. 
Okay, how is uh, liposome stability maintained due to the fact that they have charged molecules uh, inside? So, um, the, so a lipid bilayer uh, maintains, uh, in this case, these lipids are zwitter ionic, meaning they have a positive and negative charge, but the net charge on each lipid is zero. So uh, uh, the lipid bilayer is considered to be uh, a, a neutral, rather neutral. There's a slight cationic dipole on these phospholipids, but it's uh, in general, it's a... Uh, its a net uh, charge is, is almost uh, zero. And, uh, uh, and also when there's a cationic uh, or a charged molecule inside, uh, these uh, lipids uh, stay or these lipid bilayers uh, maintain, uh, I would say some stability, main uh, stability. Uh, they, we don't see them falling apart within, uh, uh, within uh, hours of, uh, of experiments and sometimes even several days. Um, uh, so I would say it's because we have less binding between the lipid bilayer and the uh, and any charged molecules that are inside due to the use of a neutral or uh, neutral uh, phospholipids. Great. Um, thank you very much, Avi, for answering all the questions. Um, I have few too, but um, we're kind of running out of time. Okay, you have another question. Maybe that could be the last one. It's in chat. Um, yeah, I think that one is at least the one. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, oh wait, no, that's just a comment. Just a comment. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. Um, I really appreciate how you're pushing the field, not just developing new technologies, but actually making it useful. Um, showing people that what synthetic cells are is not just a great basic science tool, but also actual therapeutics, practically applied therapeutics tool. Um, thank anyone... you. Yeah, I mean, thanks to everyone. It's a, it's a joint effort. I, uh, I just feel part of the team and I'm humbled really by the amazing science that people here on this, uh, uh, in this call uh, are doing. And uh, thank you for, for all the efforts. And Kate, really, thank you for leading. Thank you all. Um, if anyone has any more questions, um, we are on Slack. You can find Avi. Um, and this call will be recorded and posted uh, on Build a Cell website. Thank you so much, Avi, for making time again. And thank you for a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Have a great day. Good night.